Hello, do you have type one diabetes? Are you one of the millions of people who have a blood sugar dysregulation pattern and you're in your blood test and you're living with insulin dependency, you're living with having to take insulin every day and every night, and you're told that you need that for the rest of your life? I'm Dr. Lonnie Herman, and in this video, there's two parts. The first part I'm gonna be describing from a patient's lab tests which were done in a very big university hospital in the Carolinas here in the United States. Uh, and so you're gonna see proof of what's changed in his body with no more need of insulin in his life, at least at this point, that's how it appears. And it was not described as a honeymoon phase as people commonly say. In the second part of this video, you're gonna see a, a, a video that I filmed or somebody, my staff I should say, filmed of me discussing with one of the parents of this uh, teenager who now has been taken off all of his insulin. You're also gonna see that his A1C is normal and you're gonna see what the, this big university hospital said, and I won't mention their name, uh, but the hospital said that he no longer needs any insulin. They discontinued all of the, of the insulin medications. Okay, so right here, first thing that we're gonna do, and I've got Sally, my camera person, she's gonna zoom in. We may take a second to adjust so that you could see clearly on this camera, on this video of what's going on here, on this sheet. Right here, you could, should see the person's name is Alec. You'll see at least the first name. Do we see that clear? Okay, excellent. Now I'm gonna bring up here with Alec's test, we can see that in December, and you don't have to zoom in too close, but make it so that it's legible for all the viewers to see, Sally, okay? Can you see that? It shows here highlighted in orange that his initial test showed his A1C was a 13.8 and that was done on December of 2015. We got a clear view of that? Excellent. That around that time when I looked at his other labs, it was about a 300 glucose was the fasting glucose level. Now, the next page I have here, you're gonna see the name is the same coming out of the hospital records. Did we see that name? Can we see that name is Alec? Hopefully we could zoom in right there. We see that? Excellent. Now what you're gonna see here is that in his test of February of 2017, we should see the whole view there highlighted in orange so it's easy for you viewers to see. February of 2017 is A1C 5.7. And that's after a major decrease in insulin use and actually a discontinuation of insulin use, 5.7. Now what we're also gonna see here is glucose on that day, the fasting glucose was 112. That was fasting. And he does not eat a very healthy diet, by the way, which you'll hear the parent talk about in the next part of the video. Now I'm gonna show you the next page. Same person, you should see the name right here. Do we see a clear name, clear view of his name? Yeah, we got that good. Now what I'm gonna show you as I scan down this page, you can see current medications. This teenager, he's autistic. So with those ended medications, I want you to notice here, if you look at all of those, and we don't have to zoom in too close to read the word so clear, but you can actually, if you can just read across the sentence here, there are the uh, Novolog insulin, the Humalog insulin, discontinued. Can you see all of those showing discontinued? Every single one of his insulin medications are discontinued now. Further, we go to the bottom of this page. You don't have to zoom in too close, but we can get a clear view of the whole sentence at once right now. You see it? We got a clear view of there, Sally? So what we see here is the first diagnosis of type one diabetes with the complications, with ketoacidosis. That was on December of 2015. And what they re-diagnosed them now in 2017 is uncontrolled type one diabetes mellitus without complications. So what would uncontrolled, if you could zoom back to me, thanks. So what would uncontrolled type one diabetes without medications mean? Uncontrolled means they're not using any medicine to control the diabetic pattern. Without complications means there's no ketoacidosis, there's no blood sugar dysregulation, like in high A1C or a fasting glucose that's high. They're not having any bedwetting, there's no excessive thirst, there's no urination. They did not diagnose them as non-diabetic. I don't know if they're ever even willing to do something like that because this type of work is not in their textbooks. So type of work that I'm offering. So understand, no more blood sugar dysregulation. You'll hear what the doctor told the parent in the next part of this video. 
With this patient, my primary, the reason why they brought him down here to my clinic uh, was because of his autism and because of his diabetes. And I'm gonna be very clear, I started working on the brain first, looking for infections and toxins in his brain, which uh, would relate to his autism uh, type of expression, let's just put it that way. Uh, and you'll hear the parent in the next part of the video talking about some changes there as well for, for this patient. Uh, but uh, working with his brain was my primary uh, focus. And we see that the diabetes has changed. Brain called the hypothalamus, I'll put that word up on the side of the screen as well. Hypothalamus is a part of the human brain which has glucose sensors in it. And by the way, you're aware, you should be aware that your brain, one of the main fuels to run the brain is glucose, is blood sugar. Okay, so the hypothalamus has, in part of it, has glucose sensors. And the point of the glucose sensors are to help the brain realize if there's enough blood sugar in the brain or if there's not enough blood sugar in the brain or if there's too much blood sugar in the brain. So when the glucose sensors in the hypothalamus can determine that there's whatever level of, let's say that there's excess of blood sugar, then what it does is it sends out signals to the pancreas, to the beta cells, also known as islets of Langerhans, and it tells those beta cells, secrete some insulin. So while type one diabetes is always thought to be an autoimmune disease, not every single case of type one diabetes that was diagnosed that I've met in my clinic or has consulted with me online, not every one of these cases in their hospital records or their uh, doctor's laboratory records have they run antibody tests. I have rarely seen in type 1 diabetics or diagnosis insulin dependent type 1 that they found autoimmune antibodies against the insulin or against the pancreas tissues or against what's called a GAD65 antibody. I haven't seen all these doctors running these tests, but they look at the A1C, they hear the symptom of excessive urination, of excessive thirst, uh, possibly some weight loss or whatever other uh, condition is going on in the patient. And they run the C peptide in some cases. They run the uh, A1C and the glucose, and they're coming up with that they're type 1 diabetic and it's autoimmune uh, disease and that they just need insulin forever for the rest of their life. So without running an autoimmune diabetes panel, it is, uh, it's just a, uh, they just believe that it's autoimmune even though they never prove that it's autoimmune. While it can be autoimmune too, with an immune attack against these islet cells or beta cells, as well as the pancreas tissue, as well as uh, insulin. Well, let's understand that sometimes those panels are not run, but they're calling it autoimmune. So is it possible that when the brain mal malfunctions because of something in the hypothalamus of the brain, which tells the pancreas what to do, what happens when there's some infection or toxin, like a pesticide or a strep infection or a preservative from food, a cancer-causing preservative, which can cause disease in other parts of the body, what if those get into the brain and cause the hypothalamus to not be so sensitive to the blood sugar changes? Well, if the hypothalamus is not so sensitive because its glucose sensors are diseased for some, by some chemical or infection, or both, what happens when, those, when the hypothalamus can't sense there's too much insulin in the brain? What's it gonna do? Is it going to send a directive message down to the pancreas to secrete insulin, or is it not? I mean, it just makes sense that if the brain can't tell that there's too much blood sugar, then it may not tell the pancreas to secrete the insulin. Understand? So now I'm going to switch over to the next video. I'll see you on the other side of this video, and I look forward to helping you and a family member uh, get well, and there are ways to help somebody reverse the condition. He is a, a parent of an autistic uh, uh, a patient, an autistic boy who he brought to my clinic in South Florida from out of state, who was also diagnosed as a type 1 diabetic. And uh, let me just ask you, he was diagnosed, or if we can share with the public here, he was diagnosed as type 1 diabetic. How old is how old is Alec? Alec is now um, 19. He'll be soon be 20. Okay, 19. And he was diagnosed when he was 18 or 17 as type 1 diabetic? I believe he was 18. It was in December 2015. Okay. And he was having trouble for, what, a month before he was? Roughly a month before that, he was uh, choking. Every time he would eat, he wasn't able to eat without choking. Mm -hmm. And so you brought him to the hospital? Well, we, we called a psychiatrist because he takes uh, some medicine, and it, that was one of the side effects. And she told us to take him to the emergency room and roll out diabetes, and that she would change the medicine. However, when we got to the hospital, they hospitalized him for three or four days and uh, diagnosed him as type 1 diabetes. Type 1 diabetic, and they 
provided them insulin there and provided he, insulin through they the provided home. insulin um, we asked that they hold off on the insulin and give us 30 days to do diet and exercise because we wanted to get it under control uh, and that's when they told us that we didn't really understand that it was type 1 that it couldn't be controlled that he would be insulin dependent for the rest of his life so they they're almost in that statement was that diet has nothing to do with it that's how it right how it I sounded. mean that there's no way you can fix it without doing anything besides insulin dependent now Right, basically go home, count the carbohydrates, 60 mm -hmm. a meal, and give him his insulin. Um, they wanted to give him insulin four times a day, but because of his autism and all that, um, they did it twice a day and then PRN as needed. And how many units could you give an average of what the units were? Well, we started Throughout out Throughout a 24-hour period, what, were you, what was he taking? Well, we started out at 15, I think it's milligrams, twice a day. Mm -hmm. So for a breakfast, before he had breakfast, he'd do 15, and before dinner, 15, mm -hmm. and then he had a PRN uh, if he needed that gotcha. uh, in between. Okay. And so now it's been a year of our of our work together. Correct. And shortly before the year has come to uh, the year period, he is now, what, did they, what happened where you noticed his blood sugars were becoming normal without so much insulin? Is that what was occurring? Yeah, we... Um, we started decreasing his insulin because we noticed that his numbers were coming down and then it got to the point where we're we're doing like two milligrams and that was only because we didn't want to take it away without a doctor giving us official um, authority to do that so we took him back to his doctor and his doctor tested his sugar and the aci or whatever those are a1c the a1c okay and then he basically turned to me and said basically it's a miracle he said it's a miracle he no longer needs insulin, what have you been doing? So, um, and at that point is when they removed him from his insulin. Removed him 100% from the insulin. 100%. And they said he's not diabetic anymore. He's not diabetic. Actually, as a parent, I insisted the doctor give me testing strips and uh, insulin PRN in case I needed it. The doctor said that he would not need that, but he, uh, you know, did what I asked. I just asked that we'd be able to test it for six months and we test it periodically and his numbers are running fine and hasn't needed insulin. So. Amazing, yes? Yes. Amazing. And do pay, people don't hear about that out there. They think it's got to be a lifetime of uh, of insulin and that's it. It's the an insulin dependent uh, lifestyle. Correct. That's what we were told, that he would be yeah. insulin dependent for the rest of his life. And this doctor who you see for, for Alec, he's from a major, I mean, he's from a major university and hospital, right? Yes, he's part of a major uh, system. We don't yes. have to speak the name of them. We're not, not here to have any problem with them, but there was part of a major system, part of a major university. Hospital. A major nationally known major system. Nationally known system. And so we're pretty happy to hear that. Uh, and this came from, was it Please, I'm just going to ask you, so anybody else who has any kind of question or any kind of doubt that something like this is possible, was there any real dietary change, because I just heard the food that you let him snack on before he came in here today, was there any real restricted diet that you were doing that brought his blood sugars down? The only diet we did is we followed the protocol of 60 carbs per meal. Mm -hmm. So you stuck with that. That which was, was the only thing we did Which is what you were doing before with the insulin dependency Correct. period. Correct. So with the insulin dependent, you were staying with those carbs, and now you were staying with that diet, but he didn't need the extra insulin put into it. Correct, and actually we're, I mean, we're trying not to go to the extreme with carbs, but we're not actually counting. We're not, yeah. we're not restricting you're not counting, him to 60. You're not restricting, you're not even right. cutting out his carbs. Right, You're letting Correct. him stay with the same diet he was on when he took the insulin, when the insulin was being used. Correct, probably more, more, even more lenient than when he was on probably insulin. Probably more lenient. Yeah. Yes. So uh, it's been not a clean diet, no. Really per se, because there are some foods that really were right. not kind of healthy that well, sometimes he, he's having. He had McDonald's before we came today. Okay, so there we go. I'm just <laughs> not trying to let that out, but you let that out. And, but what we see is that he's got normal blood sugar levels, he's got no insulin, and the doctor from the major university hospital has said he is no longer diabetic. It's a miracle. And they also said, I don't remember if he said this earlier, that he just thought it was some virus that maybe was there and disappeared. Yeah, when he asked me what we've been doing, I gave him a brief explanation, and then he said it must have been a virus on his pancreas. Yeah. So what we've been doing is working through tissues in his brain, finding infections and toxins in brain tissue and stem cells and bone marrow that have caused this domino effect to complicate the function with insulin secretion, which regulates the blood sugar levels. That's what we've been doing in here. And there is research, which I'll put up on the screen for you to watch with this uh, just great and generous uh, sharing uh, by all of you, is that there 
have been tests that are in diabetes journals, if you doctors even pay attention to these journals, that there are tests that were done to show brain changes actually can regulate the function of insulin secretion, can regulate the blood sugar level, has a direct correlation to insulin secretion and glucose levels. And what we're talking about here is that infections and toxins that get into these brain tissues, which regulate the pancreas function, are, can be linked to your or your family members type 1 diabetes or type 2 diabetes. It's not all about the pancreas. It can actually be meaning directly infection on the pancreas that can cause it, which is what I find, infection and toxin in the pancreas, but actually brain tissues, which can now are connected to, because your brain controls your organs, it controls the pancreas. And the pancreas is an end, part of the endocrine system. So there's a direct correlation between brain function and something that's disturbing brain function and pancreas function or pancreas regulation of insulin secretion. So we're pretty happy about this. I'm, I'm really happy to see this. Yes, we're very happy. And uh, in addition to that, I just want to say that we've noticed like more awareness, like picking up after himself, um, taking showers on his own, just being more aware of his environment than he ever has before. From the other type of not being connected with people, right. with, from his, if it's properly diagnosed as an autism. Right. Yeah, so he's actually just waving. More aware. He's more aware. aware. Oh, more he aware waves of his hello and goodbye. Yeah. He waves hello, people. goodbye. He shakes uh, without, hands. He shakes, he shakes hands my hand now. Yeah. Or before he had to be... Uh, it, it had to be initiated. Now he will actually initiate it. And there was also a restlessness, I think, that was, right, he had a restless leg, so he would move around in mm -hmm. his bed a lot at night. Is that still, because that stopped months ago, is that, is that yeah, still? Yeah, that's pretty much stopped. I mean, it, it, rarely he'll do that. Occasionally mm -hmm. he'll do it, but it's rare. But there's a lot of improvement there. So we plan on doing more with him. I appreciate you sharing this with all the people out there who deserve to know that there is a way around it. You can call, is there anything else you want to say? No, I think no? that's... Thank you very much. Thank you. Is there, you're welcome. Is there any, uh, I'm sorry, if, for those of you who'd like to call and get an appointment here, the office number is 954-370-3100. I'll also put up the email address to my office assistant. Uh, if calling is too uh, much of a trouble, again, 954-370-3100. You can email the clinic and somebody will get back to you as soon as possible and help you uh, get an appointment in here. Thank you for letting us into your home to watch this information.